a world record adventure around the world in 74 days. Jules Verne Trophy to sail round the world in less than 80 days. I'm afraid to say we are out of the event. About two hours ago we had a, um, a big bang. We hit something hard with the starboard hull rattling along here and the impact damage has been quite uh, extensive. Enza's first attempt to circle the globe in 80 days is over. Seven brave men are cruelly robbed of a romantic record. The world's largest racing catamaran had been 72 hours ahead of schedule when disaster struck on day 26. The crew are numb with disappointment. Enza's misfortune left the ocean clear for Commodore Explorer to emulate the fictional challenge of Phileas Fogg. The French completed the 27,000 miles in 79 days, 6 hours to take the inaugural Jules Verne Trophy, named after Fogg's creator. For the co-skippers of the crippled catamaran, it meant unfinished business. Both had achieved too much in their lives to throw in the towel now. Peter Blake, a New Zealander with a home in Hampshire, one of the greatest ocean racers, is a veteran of five Whitbread Round the World races. The glittering prize was his when he skippered Steinlager to victory four years ago. Robin Knox Johnston is a true pioneer. The first man to sail solo non-stop around the world on his 32-foot catch Suheili back in 1969. Do you know, <laughs> if you stop and think a bit about it, we're doing in five hours with this boat what it was taking me to do, a day to do then. It took me 312 days then. The New Zealand Apple and Pear Board give Enza the green light for another record attempt. She's modified to be bigger and better. Catamaran emerges seven feet longer at an incredible 92 feet and redesigned to take more punishment. We have a whole false bottom to this yacht, so we should be able to um, have an impact with pieces of timber, uh, with maybe the odd whale, and get away with it okay rather than having a hole go in the boat. There's eight in the crew, and everyone's just as important uh, as each other. There are obviously areas of responsibility that people have to, to look after, um, but uh, we're pretty much a happy family. It's very important we, we enjoy it, otherwise we're not going to go very far. Food is prepared for 11 weeks at sea. <laughs> Pippa Blake, Peter's wife, is responsible for the meals and menus. Much of it is freeze-dried to keep weight to a minimum. After weeks of waiting, there's a crucial weather window, and it's all systems go. Enza's ready to leave the River Hamble. We've been using a, a top meteorologist in the United States, who has been involved with Richard Branson with his balloon runs and, and uh, a lot of lot of work with us in the past. And he predicts that uh, we've got a good chance coming up. Getting a little bit excited now, sort of getting off, going like any race, really. You know, before you get in the boxing ring, it's all, always the same, isn't it? That sort of feeling of anticipation. We were confident last time. <laughs> but, you know, um, little knowledge is a dangerous thing, I guess. And we've done a lot of work and it. We've sailed a lot of miles in it in all sorts of conditions, but it's still in the lack of the gods regarding the weather. It's all weather dependent on, on how smart we are going through the weather patterns the right way. I think if we did it in less than 79 days and 6 hours, we'd be highly delighted. If we do it in considerably less, we'll be ecstatic. Enza wants and what Enza gets 
But the giant catamaran has to plough into violent seas and beat into headwinds before reaching the Jules Verne Trophy start line. A bone-shaking experience. Blake and Knox Johnston have a race on their hands as well as a record attempt. French skipper Olivier de Cursesson has also returned for a second crack on his trimaran, renamed Lyonnaise des Eaux du May. Time is ticking away to the off. Despite being fully loaded with food and spares for the 27,000 mile race, Enza's speed astonishes all on board. The French trimaran is soon 100 miles or more in the cat's wake. We've had a lot of wind over the last few days. Oops. Quite a big sea we're going down at the moment. <laughs> a lot of water on what happens from time to time. My boots are absolutely full, just full up. Anyway, we've been at sea for three days. We're now very wet, having been very dry. And uh, we've covered over 1,200 miles straight down track, having uh, to jibe, which is zigzag downwind because of the wind direction. But uh, um, all is going well, apart from my boots, which are now full. And uh, we are probably be parallel or level with the Canary Islands by later on tonight. And in three and a bit days, that's not too bad sailing. That's pretty fast. Okay, you hungry, Mark. Huh? Nice, ready. What have your specials, Jordy? Spaghetti bolognese is a bit bland for Robin's spicy palate. Instead of sprinkling on Parmesan cheese, he adds lime pickle. In fact, he adds it to everything. Yes, the um, lime pickle adds a certain je ne sais pas quoi to the um, spaghetti bolognese. Harnessing the power of near gale force winds, Enza starts to fly. A 465 mile day is followed by 490 miles. Then on day six, a fantastic 521 miles in 24 hours. A world record for a sailing boat. This means that we've now averaged 19.05 knots. 19.05 knots for six solid days. It's just unbelievable. We are under 500 miles from the equator in six days from Usher to the English Channel. It's just incredible sailing. It's unbelievable. It's fabulous being a part of it. Enza's dash south is unrelenting. Leonese tries to stay in touch but is becalmed in the doldrums. Blake and Knox Johnston power through the windless zone and set another world record of seven days and four hours between Ushant and the equator. Into the South Atlantic and Enza's crew can't believe their luck. They're four days ahead of schedule. But then, off the coast of Brazil, the inevitable happens. We've had some very fast sailing over the last few days, uh, but at the moment we're beating dead to windward as we make our way through a, a high-pressure area and we expect to be going quite slowly until probably Sunday night, the next 48 hours, before we hit the westerlies. We've uh, hit a bit, a bit of a brick wall, but at least it's a bit cooler for a change. We have the usual maintenance going on, but altogether very, very minor. It's a different vessel altogether, and I think probably 15, maybe 20% faster than before. We're doing mileages that last time we couldn't even really have dreamt about, but really it's just the start, and so if we liken it to a 100-yard dash, we're off the blocks and going, but that's about all, and a lot's going to happen yet. 
the lull proves to be just a hiccup. As soon as the wind fills in, Enzer picks up speed and is on record pace again. Hampshire, the Blake family look forward to Peter's regular phone calls from the yacht. Pippa's food has been a great success. Working out perfectly, apart from perhaps a little bit of extra potato, which is neither here nor there. So that's uh, well done to you girls. Thank you. Hello, Daddy. I passed my eyes on my seven times table. Oh, that's very good. Was it quite easy? Mm, quite. My six times table was. Life on Enza, meanwhile, is becoming increasingly difficult. Conditions are cutting up rough as the yacht dips well below Cape Town, South Africa and heads towards the remote spot where their first record attempt came to an end. The highest wind we've had is 55 knots. The highest sea we've had is between 15 and 20 metres. They're hard to measure. They've been big. They've been nasty. And the danger is that you run down the front of one wave and you run so fast the bow doesn't have a chance to lift up and you cannon into the back of the wave in front. Brings the boat up to a shuddering stop. Everything shakes and people get thrown forward. That's how Peter got hurt, unfortunately. Blake's back and ribs are severely bruised. It's ten days before he's fully fit. Enzo, though, is in good shape and ready to take on the Southern Ocean. of Enza's round-the-world bid for the Jules Verne Trophy. The catamaran's on course to smash by six days the previous record of 79. But co-skippers Peter Blake and Robin Knox Johnston are entering perhaps the most hazardous stage of the race. High pressure over New Zealand and the associated light winds is forcing Enza ever deeper into the frozen wastes of the Southern Ocean to stay on the pace. The huge catamaran will skirt the Antarctic ice pack before heading north to round the notorious Cape Horn at the bottom of South America. Enza had never intended to risk sailing so close to Antarctica. For all on board, they're in uncharted and dangerous waters. for the screaming 60s. The catamaran is becalmed. Blake calls it a frozen parking lot. Enza records her shortest daily run, just 88 miles at an average speed of three and a half knots. When the wind blows, it's from the wrong direction. Mindful of the beating she took while punching into strong headwinds off Ushant, Enza proceeds with caution. Blowing very hard. 
We're 61 and a half degrees south, about 900 miles to the southwest of Cape Horn, and we have the wind coming from Cape Horn, it's a northeasterly, and uh, it's about 35 to 40, I reckon gusty 45 plus. The seas are getting very, very steep, five, six meters. The barometer is dropping like a stone, it's gone down six millibars in the last two hours. I uh, expect to have a frontal system coming through fairly shortly. Sailors down the centuries have approached Cape Horn with trepidation. Seas and prevailing winds which race clockwise around the globe largely unhindered suddenly funnel through Drake Passage between South America and Antarctica. Storms here can be horrendous. In Enza's case, even worse. The wind is from dead ahead. She's forced to drop all sails, heave to, and ride out the storm. We estimated the seas to have been up at over 60 feet high. That's the height of a six-storey building, over 18 metres, maybe higher. With all the top breaking down the crest, the, the sea was just great white patches of foam. All of the surface of the sea was being ripped off. It was a bit like being in a forest fire, just smoking everywhere. The weather we've had the last day, it shows Cape Horn reasserting itself. Cape Horn basically saying, hey, you thought it was easy, but I'm the big guy around here, and I'm just going to let you pass, but think yourselves lucky. We entered this area, New Zealand to Cape Horn, 1,500 miles ahead of Lyonnais Dezo, our French rival. She's now only 360 miles astern of us. She's been able to catch up because she's had better winds than us. to have a wash. That's the first fresh water, apart from rain, I've had on my face for 40 days. Of course, right this minute we're becalmed, but we hope to pick up again and get racing up towards the equator within the next couple of days. Calms and headwinds seem to have conspired to stall the Big Cat's progress. But when Blake and Knox Johnston tie the knot, cross their outward path, Enza's still three and a half days ahead of her 77-day target, and Leonese will not catch her. This is the uh, little shower in the doldrums. Noah's Ark is just up over the, over the horizon. can mean a tasty alternative for dinner. But when they're wrapped around the blade like this shark, it only serves to slow you down. We've got about a thousand odd miles to run, which, uh, you know, it doesn't sound very far, but it's, uh, it is still quite a long way. But I guess we'll start getting a bit edgy fairly shortly. Uh, channel fever will start to develop amongst the crew, and it's going to be a grand time. What we have to be careful of now is that we aren't foolish, we don't overdrive the boat, we look after the boat and ourselves, we make sure nothing breaks between here and the finish line. We've checked the boat over, we're constantly double checking. This boat has now done the equivalent of 43 fast net races. She is tired and we have to nurse her. So we're just going to take it terribly easily until we get home. There's nothing we'd want to risk now, there's too much to lose. 
36 hours from the finish and fear of losing everything so close to home is a real possibility. 50 knot squalls and big seas are pushing Enza too fast. She could nosedive. The decision is made to slow her down by dragging ropes and chains off her stern. Crewman Barry Mackay performs heroics as he sets about the task. continue unabated. Even with the makeshift sea anchor and two handkerchiefs for sails, ends are still travelling at nearly 10 knots. We're now about 28 miles from the finish line. After some 26,500 miles, so close to the finish. Too early yet to get too overconfident about it. We've still got a 4.7 wind out there. It's still occasionally gusting force 8 or 9 and the seas are still very, very large indeed. There's still at least 12 metres in height of sea out there. We've got warps out the back just to slow us down because last night we took off down the front of the wave, buried the bows in, and this is how Peter got hurt before. Our philosophy being very much one of, hey, let's just get there, don't let's rush. We're not racing any longer. This is survival, this is seamanship. It's just getting to our destination, proper seamanship. <laughs> near the finish line, race officials spot Enza triumphantly riding the tail of the 50 knot sou'westerly. A new world record is about to be set. Taken the 92 foot catamaran 74 days, 22 hours, and 17 minutes to sail non stop around the world. Enza shatters the existing world record by nearly four and a half days to claim the Jules Verne Trophy. Hi, Chris. Hello, dear. How are you? Hi, Chris. We had good luck all the way for the first half. That was a lot of good luck. Terribly quick. Then we had bad luck, but we were still able to go quite well. I think any other boat's got to expect that same mix. And I think you probably need a bigger boat to beat it. Who's ever finished a yacht race? Towing hundreds of metres of warp, all your anchor chain, all your anchor warp tied up. No sail. Unbelievable. 74 days and a bit. You happy with that? I think you do it in 67. <laughs> but it won't be me. Next Sunday at 10.45, The Man from Malpaso.